The state and federal governments have agreed in principle to a dam on the Coal River in drought-stricken southeast Tasmania. The decision was announced tonight by the Minister for National Development, Senator Sir John Carrick, and the Tasmanian Minister for Water Resources, Mr Beswick. The Craigbourne Dam will cost $6.5 million and is part of the federal government's bicentennial water development program. The ministers said the Craigbourne Dam was expected to become one of the key elements in the Southeast Water Development Plan to be presented to the state government in April. In Victoria, police are combing thick bushland following the discovery yesterday of human bones. Police say the remains are of an 18-year-old woman. Four female skeletons have now been found in the area, 70 kilometres east of Melbourne. Police say all women died in 1980. This is the track which runs off the Princess Highway and into the bush where the latest skeleton was found. The remote area has become a killer's dumping ground which has left police with few clues. A team of about 40 police were called to the site today to begin a painstaking search for any other remains. The group lined up shoulder to shoulder as they worked their way through the country with shovels, rakes and metal prods. More bones were soon discovered. These ribs are part of the skeleton located yesterday. The area is only one kilometre away from where three female skeletons were found accidentally two years ago. Police have still not solved the murders of 14-year-old Catherine Headland, Anne-Marie Sargent, aged 18, and Miss Bertha Miller, aged 75, an aunt of the Chief Police Commissioner, Mick Miller. Police believe the women were abducted off the street, killed and then driven to the isolated spot to be dumped. Inspector Bill Brand says the intensive search is difficult. It's a soul-destroying type of search where um, it's difficult to really take a piece of country apart to the degree that you need to do to say there's no more evidence there. Police hope tests on the teeth and pelvis will help identify the body. The search for any other remains in the area is expected to continue for several days. Mark O'Brien reporting from Tainong North. A Victorian woman has been killed in a motorcycle accident at Nubina on the Tasman Peninsula. The woman, aged 21, was a pillion passenger. The motorcyclist, aged 19, escaped serious injury. Police said the motorcycle apparently slid in loose gravel. As campaigning for the March the 5th election begins in earnest, a war of words is developing between the major party leaders. The Prime Minister gave notice today that he would be playing heavily on Mr Hawke's term as President of the ACTU. After a strategy meeting in Sydney, Mr Hawke immediately accused the government of, of mudslinging in an attempt to take the initiative in the election campaign. Mr Fraser told reporters in Melbourne that massive industrial unrest and high wage increases had highlighted Mr Hawke's reign at the head of the union movement. He said the country was still suffering the effects of those excesses. Mr Hawke was president of the ACTU for 10 years. And in that 10 year period, you might be interested to know that there were 32 million man days lost as a result of industrial disputes. And uh, that's uh, in the previous decade, there were about eight and a half million man days lost. So th three times, more than three times more. Now, Mr. Hawke can't say that uh, that's because he had a nasty recalcitrant government to deal with, because the record days lost were in a time when uh, there was Mr. Hawke as president of the union movement, president of the Labour Party, and with his good mate, Gough Whitman, as prime minister. And in that year, they lost over six million man days and uh, people will need to look at that practical record. It's no good just looking at images. And it's what we've been about today is putting in place the presentation of the Australian people of the, of the positive policies that we've got for the reconstruction and reconciliation of Australia, which is by way of, uh, which is by way of contrast, I might say, to the unfortunate uh, fact that Mr Fraser in his desperation has already descended to uh, personal abuse of me, personal denigration. I will not be doing that, and what we're about here is, as I say, putting in the place our policies, that's been done, and from here on in we'll be presenting those policies to the Australian electorate. Any personal abuse uh, in this election will be coming from the desperate Mr Fraser. The Bolivian government has expelled a Nazi fugitive, Klaus Barbie, and put him on a plane to France, where he's under sentence of death for war crimes. Barbie, who's 69, was taken from prison straight to the airport. The chartered plane his own is expected to land in France early tomorrow, Australian time. 
father, who's been going under the name of Osman, has twice been sentenced to death in France after being convicted of having sent hundreds of Jews and resistance fighters to their deaths during the Second World War. Known as the Butcher of Lyon, he fled to South America after the war. West Germany's Chancellor, Helmut Kohl, has begun talks in England with Britain's Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher. The nuclear missile issue, particularly the American plan to place Pershing and cruise missiles in Europe, is expected to be high on the agenda. Ms. Kohl is only a month from the most important election in West Germany since the war, and the nuclear question is playing a big part in it already. At a news conference, Mrs. Thatcher showed they both agreed that the American zero option wasn't by any means the last word as far as they were concerned. They are agreed that the zero option remains far and away the best solution to the problem of INF missiles in Europe. We endorse President Reagan's proposal that he and Mr. Andropov should sign an agreement banning all United States and Soviet intermediate range land-based nuclear missiles. But we emphasize that the zero option is not a take it or leave it proposal. Mrs. Thatcher, like most other NATO leaders, is pinning all her hopes on Mr. Cole in next month's German election. Without him, she knows that NATO's chances of sticking to its line and introducing American cruise missiles later this year will be a great deal less. The Pentagon now says the nuclear fuel, fuel I'll start it again, I think. The Pentagon now says the nuclear, nuclear fuel core of the Soviet satellite, Cosmos 1402, will probably burn up before reaching the ground. American officials said the fuel core had dropped to an orbit 170 kilometers above the Earth and probably would enter the atmosphere in the first half of next week. The Soviet satellite launched last August to monitor naval activity in the South Atlantic during the Falklands War began to lose orbit in December. The main part fell harmlessly back to Earth over the Indian Ocean on January the 23rd. The long arm of the English law has averted what threatened to be a minor civil war in Scotland. It began with the refusal of a Scottish poet to pay rates on a farm building he claims is a temple. The local sheriff was ordered to remove artworks in payment for the rates, but the poet was well prepared. Lookouts were posted at dawn as Poets' Corner prepared for the showdown. Checkpoint Sandy, named in honour of the sheriff's officer, was freshly painted. A cardboard tank was dug in, hull down, to defend the converted cow shed. Strathclyde Council says Mr Hamilton Finlay uses it as an art gallery and must pay rates. The poet says it's a temple and the sheriff's men can't come in. The garden temple is already locked, closed. All these doors and windows are reinforced and inside. So if they want to get in, they'll have to break their way in. Meanwhile, the sheriff's officer, Sandy Walker, had arrived at checkpoint Sandy. The wet paint was the first obstacle. But he was let in. But try as he might, he couldn't get into the building to see his artwork. When he went to leave, a tractor had inconveniently broken down on the only road, leading him to walk towards the nearest police station several miles away. It took just an hour to round up his posse. Mr. Walker got inside, but all the artworks had been removed. The poet emerged from his hideout with his hands up. The sheriff's officer had cut his hands, but it was the only blood spilt at Poet's Corner. The showdown was over. Cricket and the scene is set for an exciting finish to the qualifying matches for the World Series Cup. New Zealand defeated England by three wickets in a rain shortened match in Perth today and moves into the finals. Australia has to defeat New Zealanders tomorrow to make the finals. Anything less and England will qualify. Government restrictions on weekend trading hours have angered many businessmen for years. However, one Melbourne shopkeeper has turned the tables on the Victorian government's laws. At the George and Helen Great Bookshop, the prices aren't cheap. For example, the books on this table sell for almost $1,500. However, there's one large advantage to shopping here, because with each book you buy, you get a billiard table free. It's a new method of beating the ban on Sunday trading, which will be tested tomorrow by Astra Billiard Table manufacturer George Gregg, who spent most of last week in jail for legally selling his tables on a Sunday. But selling books at weekends is legal, 
and Mr. Gregor's daring the state government to take him to court. Well, I'm showing how ludicrous the law is. I fought the law honestly over the last two years, but my business cannot afford the continuous fines, and my family and I would prefer not to have to face the ordeal of prison again. Finally, the weather. A ridge of high pressure extending to Tasmania from the high in the Tasman Sea will continue to, co to control our conditions tomorrow. There's a cold front approaching, but it's decaying and should have little effect as it crosses tomorrow.